Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Back to Basics Number 2, Practical Capacitor Charging Losses. Please be aware that this is a follow-up on a previous uh, video that I've posted. Here is the title and this is the link. And I'm going to print the link on the description section of the video that you are now watching. In a previous presentation, I was discussing this system in which we have a capacitor bank here, it could be of an inverter, converter, or any other system. And then we have a battery source, a power source, and we need to connect the battery to the unit, that is to the capacitor. Now if we do it directly through S2, then it's going to be a very, very high current that could be damaging the semiconductors and as well as the capacitor. So to ease the charging process, we usually use a pre-charger. That is, we have another switch with a resistor that is charging the capacitor in a slower rate. Here I'm showing the voltage on the capacitor after S1 is turned on. And then after a while, at a given time that we decide on, we turn on S2. And this will be under some voltage. We don't want to wait too long, so a decision is made as to a given point we're going to connect it. In the previous presentation, I was talking about the current. What is the current that we develop at this point? Okay, and I'm considering a case in which the total inductance in the loop, that is the cable, the battery, and the capacitor inductances are taken into account here, and also the total resistance of the loop, like the battery, the cable, and of course the ESR of the capacitor. So this is like an equivalent circuit that takes into account the parasitics, this is not something that you like to put in. This is just the parasitics of the system. This is put in in order to start the pre-charge. In this presentation, I'm focusing on the question of what are the losses in this case, when you turn on S2 in this circuit, the losses that are usually there when you are charging a capacitor. Now, this may not be a very important question in this situation. That is, well, there are some losses and this is not something that you worry about it too much when you connect a battery to a capacitor. So the purpose of this presentation is primarily educational because I think the knowledge that uh, will emerge from watching this uh, video can be then applied to other areas, for example, like a resonance switch capacitor converter. So let's see what it is all about. To study the question of the losses, I've set up here a schematics, a two parts to this schematics. This represents the actual circuit we are talking about. This is the inductor, resistor, and capacitor. This is the voltage. I'm assuming 5 volt at closure. And then I've put here actually a calculation of the energy lost. And this is by looking at the resistor voltage across it and current across it and integrating it uh, by this capacitor one farad. So the voltage here is the energy lost during the process. So we have actually two parts here, so I can run them in parallel. One is with an inductor and one is without an inductor, just a resistor. And then I'm stepping the resistor from one milliohm to 100 milliohm, that is the total resistance in this circuit. Now what about losses? Amazing. Perhaps we would have expected that in the case of the inductor, there be less losses. They are not. This is the sweep of the resistance. The red is the inductor case, and this, so gray blue, say, is the resistive case. You see, they are all converging to 37.5 millijoule, okay? No matter what is the resistance. This is the resistance here, again, is between 1 milliohm and 100 milliohm. So it doesn't matter, they all converge to this 37.5 millijoule. Now, we know that in capacitor charging, the loss is C delta V square over 2. Now, we have the C, we know that that's 5 volt, and indeed, this value is 37.5. So no matter what is the resistance or whether there is an inductance or not, the energy loss is 37.5. 
interesting. So why is this? Well, we can do the calculation in an overview of, this, of the operation of what is going on without going into the very fine details of the current and the resistance and whatever. So the way I'm doing it here is the following. I have an input voltage, I have a capacitor, and I'm assuming that the end of the process, the voltage of the capacitor, will be equal to the input voltage, okay? So this is charging the capacitor from V in. There is an amount of charge now moving from V in to the capacitor. This is the same charge. There is a conservation of charge. So therefore, we can express the energy that is fed by the input, and this will be like Q times V in from the source, and then the same Q going to the output. The energy at the output is Cv squared over 2. This is the energy stored in a capacitor, and I am using this equation of Q and Cv to replace the capacitor, and I'm coming up with this value, Qv in over 2. So you see that the output is Qv in, the capacitor energy is Qv in over 2, so half of the energy is lost. Well, this is very well known. But the point that I'm making is no matter what is this process, doesn't matter. The same energy is lost. So now let's trick the circuit and let's put a diode here, here and here. I've put here an ideal diode and here's the model of the diode. It has a forward voltage of zero and a resistance of one microohm and a back resistance of 10 megaohms, like an ideal diode. Of course, this could be implemented by a switch. It should be synchronized, we'll see it in a minute. So this diode now allows current to go in one direction. Everything else is the same as before. So now the current, of course, will be only positive. So we are going to see only the positive part of it. And this is again for one milliohm, 10 milliohm, and 100 milliohm. And now what about the energy lost? Lo and behold, we see different values. So in the case of one milliohm, there's only four millijoules. This is the joules, of course, energy. 10 milliohms, it's about, what, 25. And uh, 100 milliohm, it's approaching this uh, 37.5. So the question is, how come? On the one hand, I just showed you this rationale of uh, if uh, the capacitor is approaching the voltage of the VIN, then uh, from outside, just without worrying about the current and what is going on in the process, we find that half of the energy is lost. And the answer to this question is the fact that when you put a diode with an inductor, the output voltage is not the input voltage. It could be higher. Now, in the case of a resistor, obviously, with a diode or without a diode, the output voltage will be 5 volt because we have, we have an input voltage of 5 volt. In the case of an inductor, it really depends on the quality factor and the voltage could be higher. In fact, with a very high quality factor that is with a very small resistance, then you can get uh, twice the input voltage, that is 10 volt. And you can see that in, in the one milliohm case, we are already approaching the 10 volt. So the point is that this, so the point is that the analysis I've shown is incorrect for this case. In this case, the capacitor has a higher voltage than V in, and therefore the energy lost could be lower. Now, without going into all the equations involved, from an intuitive point of view, we can understand it as follows. In the case that an inductor, just an inductor without a resistor, is a link between the V in and the capacitor, we have here a lossless process. Charging an inductor from a voltage source is lossless. There's no energy lost. All the energy is stored in the inductor. And then when the inductor is feeding the energy to the capacitor, this is also a lossless process. Now, if you have a resistor, then of course, some energy is lost. Now, if you have a diode, 
then you have only the positive part. Without a diode, the capacitor will eventually reach the same voltage as the input, and then the analysis I have made is valid. So if the voltage is higher, then the energy loss could be actually lower. So therefore, you can conclude that if you have a charging process with an inductor, then the capacitor voltage could be between V in and 2V in, and the losses will depend where it is in between these two. So this actually explains this seemingly paradox in this case. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you found it of interest. Thank you very much.